serve. Showing ourselves a pattern of good works. Can you say that? Showing ourselves a pattern of good works. What does that mean, a pattern? A model, right? Sometimes we need a model. Sometimes we need to see, right? Somebody else living it out. Sometimes we read the word of God, right? And we read it and we say, what does that look like? I hear what it says. I understand the Greek words, right? I I understand the definitions, but I've never really seen it lived out like that. Can you show me how, right? Which state is the show me state? Which one? Missouri? Okay. I see that's why I didn't know because I've never been to Missouri. I don't think, have I ever been to Missouri? No. Is that the South? Is that considered the South? No, <laughs> Elisha. He said, no, sir. No, sir. You got to be in South Carolina to be in the South, right? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Well, hey, we're going to jump right in. That, was that song challenging for you at all? I have to admit, when I first heard that song, uh, I was like, you know, you can have it all? No, no. I'm not ready for that. Come on, I'm just being honest. Can we be honest with one another? When I heard that song and it said, you know, you can have it all, I was like, no. All my time, all my energy, my health, can, can you, have you really come to that place where you can sing with your whole heart, you can have it all, Lord? Lord? Because I think sometimes that's a real struggle. And I think in order to sing that, we start singing it by faith. And then the Lord reveals it to us that it's already all his. And it's really just a change of paradigm. It's all his. I belong to him. Right? It's not about what we give him. I already belong to him. I've been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6.20 think seven, five, right? I, I already belong to him. He purchased me and I belong to him. Amen. So if you understand that paradigm correctly, I already belong to him. I'm already his. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, hey, I'm just going to take a moment and I'm going to read this passage in Titus chapter two, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about some of the specifics. Amen? But you speak the things which become sound doctrine, healthy teaching. Talk about it. Teach it. Speak about healthy teaching, what it produces. Okay? That the aged men, or I prefer mature men, men like Joseph and Jay and Dave and Brian and Elisha, Kevin, right? Pastor Boone, Alan, Dave, Dan Allen, right? Robert, don't want to miss anybody, right? Andre, Jude, Jack, right? The mature men, right? Giving you a little benefit of the doubt there. The mature men be sober, grave, temperate. Now, those aren't words we use every day. Those are old King James words, so we're going to come back and define them. Sound in faith, healthy in in teaching, in faith, in belief, in charity, in patience, and the mature women, likewise, live similarly, that they be in behavior as becomes holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they, the mature women, teach the young women to be sober, to love their own husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, hang on, obedient, to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed or spoken against. 
Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, to think clearly. In all things, showing thyself or demonstrating a pattern of good works. In doctrine, in teaching, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort slaves, and be clear, it says slaves. Exhort slaves to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering or really what we would call in my home, my mom called it back-talking, right? Not answering again, not purloining. That's a great King James word. Have you ever heard it? Purloining. But showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Okay? Now, can you agree with me this morning that this is a challenging passage? There's some really tough stuff that this, in just a little paragraph, a very short paragraph that was read in less than a minute, right, is bringing up these major topics. Some of them are a hotbed for conflict across our nation today, right? The relationship between husbands and wives, right? What happened in our country and around the world, slavery, right? These are things that the Word of God addresses, right? And, and it makes it very clear. And there's some really important principles right, for our conduct, our behavior, how we live our lives, how we model an example in Christianity, okay? And so uh, this morning, we don't want to offend anybody, so we're just going to avoid teaching this. No, Sheila said, no, pastor, teach it. Samantha said, she's whispering under her mask, so, hey, we're going to jump right into it, and I hope, I hope if you're here online that you're really, you have your Bible open, you take the time to take some notes, to look at the words, and we want to give you some definitions and, and really just take time to teach this, because when we do, when we unfold it, I think you're going to be very blessed with what the Word of God has to say, because the Word of God has answers for everything that the world is going through. The word of God is so crystal clear. And if we follow God's pattern and God's example, it will lead us to peace. Do you believe that? I believe that with all my heart. I believe that God is a sovereign God and nothing that is happening in the world today surprises him. He, he's, the, he's the author and the finisher of our faith, right? In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2, right? He... he you know, he authored what was going to happen, and it happens according to his predetermined plan in Romans 8, 29, which he planned before the foundation of the earth. He's the one who was and is and always will be, and he is in complete control, and he is allowing things to unfold perfectly according to his plan, and he's not surprised by any of it. And we who know him will do well when we follow what his word says. You know, if you ever find yourself in a really difficult place and you're struggling with what to do, a good place to go is the word of God. Because you can go to the Word of God and it will give you clear definition on the decisions you should make. And maybe not specifically the decisions you make, but the principles that will lead you to make good decisions. Amen? So the first thing he says in verse 1 is speak things which produce health. Healthy teaching 
produces a healthy life. Amen? Sound, healthy teaching. And here the word things uh, refers specifically to things that are going on. Right? Remember, Paul left Titus in Crete and left him there to set in order the things that were lacking, the things that were wanting, the things that were deficient. And so things are going to occur. Things are going to arise among people in the fellowship. Right? That's just what happens. Right? And so when things are going on in the assembly, in the fellowship of people, there are specific things that the Word of God gives definition to, and we take what the Word of God says and we apply it in our relationships in the fellowship that we have. There are things that, that are happening all around us, and the Word speaks, and we have permission from the Word of God to speak things from His Word to the things that are going on all around us in the world in which we live right? And, and it refers specifically to that which is suited or uh, fitting to address the problems, the errors, the unhealthy lifestyles of the community of faith in the church. And it's the responsibility of the elders, right, going back to Titus 1, to teach, to set in order, right, the things that are deficient and to use scriptural truth uh, that develops well-rounded, healthy interaction between those who are in the community of faith. Amen? So, healthy teaching produces healthy fellowship, healthy interaction, healthy dialogue between people. Amen? And, and it's such a beautiful thing, healthy ministry, healthy serving. It all flows from God's word and the teaching that we receive, right? So that's verse one. So verse two, Paul mentions mature men, right? And it's, he uses the word presbuteros. Now this can be used as an office of elder, somebody who in the church has been ordained to lead in the church as an elder. But it also just refers to mature men right? Anybody that's a mature man, and the words can be inter, used interchangeably, right, in, in its context. But, but specifically, in order to be uh, someone who has the office of an elder, you have to live as an elder, as a mature man, according to what these scriptures teach. Amen? Okay? But you may be a man that lives and walks according to these these things that the Word of God teaches, but you may not have the office of an elder. Is that clear? Right? Okay. But the reason that he calls this out is because he wants these men to be an example, to take on the responsibility to understand that people are watching. Right? That, that as we live our life, and sometimes we may not even say anything, that people are still watching. People are still imitating our behavior. Remember 1 Corinthians 11.1? 1, right? 1 Corinthians 4.16, Ephesians 5. Right? Paul said, be imitators of me. Follow me as I follow Christ. Right? Paul said, I'm setting an example. Mimic me. Now remember when we taught Ephesians and, and different times, we, we've made illustration that Jesus, when he called his disciples to follow him, he used a different word. He used the word akalutheo. It means to attach yourself to someone in order to extract the desired favor, blessing, or privilege. Attach yourself. Now, Paul never used that word. No teacher in the Bible other than Jesus Christ used the word akalutheo. They said, imitate. Don't attach yourself, right? Jesus did not commit himself to men because he knew what was in men, right? Sin. Can you give me an amen, Joan? Right? People sin. So we don't attach ourselves to people. But when we see good behavior modeled among God's people, we imitate the good behavior that we see. Amen? And so 
That, that's a beautiful thing, amen? So the first thing a mature man must do in order to set an example is show up. Hello? We've often said the greatest ability is availability, right? Like we sang today, right? You can't copy someone if they're not there to copy. We've got to show up. Uh, Brian was quoting uh, in the lobby this morning we were talking about, and he, he brought up Hebrews 10.24, provoke one another unto love and good works, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but do it much more as you see the day approaching. And the, the obvious you know, disconnect today is we, we are having a hard time gathering together because of the COVID virus and all the, the um, confusion related to what's happening with the COVID virus. Nobody wants to contract it. Nobody wants elderly people to contract it. Nobody wants people with pre-existing health conditions to contract it. And there's a great fear of what it looks like you know, to contract it. And so we take extra measures to be very safe. And we are right here. And if you're watching on online, we don't say this to condemn you. We're thankful that you're online. But we want you to know that we're all spaced out here. I mean, not spaced out, but... (laughs) I mean, it depends who you talk to. Pastor Boone said he's spaced out. He's not spaced out. Amen. Well, listen, no, we're, we're, we're practicing social distancing, and we have our masks on, and we're being very careful when we gather together. But listen, the idea behind modeling an example is to be together in worship so people see how you worship. Now, we don't worship outwardly in order for people to see us. Our, our, our worship is authentic. But it's observable as authentic worship, love for God, love for Jesus Christ, celebrating who God is, and reverent of his presence. Amen? Like, people need to see that, right? And, you know, I've got many illustrations, but my dear friend John, who came here years ago, and when he first came here, he saw people lifting their hands. And he was like, what is that all about? He got born again, and he started coming. He saw these people lifting their hands, and he said, that is just bizarre, right? And he didn't come, so I I gave him a call. And so I said, let's have lunch. And we sat down, and we had lunch. And he said, what is that all about? You know, and I showed him 1 Peter chapter 2, lifting up holy hands unto the Lord. And, and you know, and we talked about the principle, this Greek word antonizo, that we're just extending our antennas up toward God. We're reaching out to him. And I don't know, somewhat, somehow I've come to this understanding for me personally in my own conscience that when I'm receiving something from God, I open my hands, palm up because I feel like I'm receiving something from him. And sometimes I'm extolling praises toward him, and so I extend my hands outwardly, right? And and sometimes I'm just resting in his praise, and I might let my hands down. See, and, and it's different for every person. That's just something in my own conscience that, that I sense when I'm worshiping God. But people need to see that. They need to see you worship. They need to see and hear people pray. They need to see people give and sacrifice and serve. And they see somebody coming to the door and, and a young man walks into the church and you know, he's got his hands full. He's, he's eating, you know, some tater tots, you know, or uh, a donut from Dunkin' Donuts or something. And, and he's walking, he's got a coffee and he's got a donut. And, and then he sees another man open the door for the people. And he goes, oh, maybe I shouldn't be walking into the church with things in my hand. Maybe I should come to serve. And they see that observable. You say, that's silly. Well, that's what happened with me. 
I remember going to a convention. You've heard the story. And at one of the ushers, he said, I I'm sorry, son. You'll have to finish that food before you enter into the sanctuary. And I was like, yeah, right. And he was like, yeah, right. Thank you for understanding. You can just stay right out there until you finish your food. This is a place of worship. Out there you can eat. And I was like, wow. He's serious about this stuff, isn't he? You know, I was brand new in the church, and I finished my food, and I came in, had a little attitude. Then I was in and worshiping and singing the songs and heard the message and was furiously taking notes as fast as I could. I love God. I just hadn't been taught. So this man came after the service and came and took a seat next to me, put his arm around me. And he said, please, I hope you weren't offended. I've been asked because we have new carpet and new chairs and not to allow food or drink into the sanctuary. And, you know, I, I didn't want to interfere with your worship, but it's so obvious that you love God and God has a call upon your life and he's going to use you in great ways. But part of that is understanding the order of what we do. I don't remember what was preached that day. I'm, I probably took six or eight pages of notes, scribbling as fast as I could. But I'll never forget that mature man sitting next to me and putting his arm around me and explaining to me about worship and order and respect. I was taught so many lessons in two minutes that I will never forget. Do you see that? See, this is, this is what mature men do. They take time to invest in one another. We don't just blow by people. Every person is an individual made in the image of God, and we value them, and we take time for every person. Now, sometimes logistically it gets a little strange, right? Because when there's a lot of people, you're all passing by and you're talking to one person and they begin to tell you their life story starting at age three. And 16 people pass by and it's hard to have a really in-depth conversation in the lobby, right? Because you want to respect every person that is gathered in the name of Christ. Are you with me? But how we visit, how we care for the sick, right? How we encourage, right? How we grieve, how we suffer, how we handle conflict, how we treat our wives is modeled before people and people are watching. And there's a myriad of behaviors that are not taught from the pulpit, but are caught because they are demonstrated by godly men and women demonstrating them in the fellowship. Amen? And that only happens when we gather together on Sundays or in small groups or we go out informally to eat and we're together in the car, we're, which we can't do any of that right now, but, but when we do, these are things, behaviors, right? So it says a mature man is someone who is first, in the Greek, is first, it says grave. Now that's a very strange word. It's Greek word semnos. It means serious, right? He's aware of what he says and what he does and how he carries himself because people are watching. Now, it doesn't mean he has a scowl on his face. It doesn't mean he looks like he's angry, right? It's not that kind of serious, but he, hopefully he has a sense of humor and he can laugh and he doesn't take himself too serious, but he is serious in the fact that he is aware that he is modeling a form of behavior of godliness and that people are watching and observing. Are you with me this morning, right? So he leads himself so that he can be an example to others. The second word here is, is the word sober, sophronizo, and it means sensible. He thinks things through. Right? He, he exercises a non-anxious presence. He doesn't overreact to situations. 
It's not a knee-jerk reaction, right? This happened, and all of a sudden, you react, right? It's a, a person that is sober it is, is very leveled. They, they don't, you don't see these big ups, highs, lows, spikes, right? They, they're pretty, you can count on them because they think things through, right? Because they're leading themselves, right? And their emotions, right? They're emotionally intelligent. So they don't react because if people are up and down, you don't know where they're going to be. It's hard to follow. Amen? And then it says here temperate, but it's not actually in the Greek text, but it's implied right through these two words that this man is in control of himself. He's not out of control. He's under control of the Holy Spirit, right? Then it says sound in faith. Can someone say amen? Right? He's true to the teaching of God's word and a balanced approach to scripture like 2 Timothy 2.15. He's rightly dividing the word of truth. He's got a clear perspective of, of grace and the law, right? Uh, of love, right? And discernment, right? He has a very balanced approach to life and he understands who God is and he understands people. And we receive love from God and we give that love to people. And we balance this, right? Because that's what healthy ministry does, right? And then he says in charity, right? Um, he operates from a foundation of unconditional love is his premise, right? Like we're just, we walk in love. We, we function in love. Unconditional love is our premise. It's our foundational premise of how we relate to people. But we also have a balance that we, we have to deal with real life situations and we have to speak the truth in love and tell the truth and make corrections and make changes and discern things and discern truth from error, right? That's part of it. But we still have this premise of love, right? And then how about this? He says, in patience, right? And it means that that person abides in fellowship with Christ, and is, continues to be faithful, steadfast, immovable in the midst of trials, persecution, tribulation, conflicts, right? This person is ab abides, right? This is just, this is a mature man. This is what he does, right? And the idea is this, this idea, like you have to really understand what is Paul teaching Titus? He's teaching him this premise that, that we're here not to serve at our own pleasure, right? Like it or not, in the fellowship of believers, people are looking to mature people who are at God's service. They realize that we've been called out of the world to assemble together, and when we're gathered together in the name of Christ, we're here not just because we want to be here, we're here, sometimes we're here to serve others, to model an example, and people are watching whether we like it or not. Now, come on, help me out. Are there times that you just wish people weren't watching? Are there times when you said, hey, I, I didn't ask to be an example. <laughs> I'm not looking to be an example right now. Close the cell phone. Right? Sure, we all, but, but the reality is the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout all the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is mature toward him, Second Chronicles 16, 9. So even if people aren't watching, God is watching, amen? And so we live our life knowing that God is watching, that people are watching, and that's a healthy way to live, amen? You know, it's interesting isn't it the, the change in culture? Now, some of you may not be able to relate to this, right? Nate uh, and different ones, Gabriel and Catherine and different ones. But, but over the last 30 years, culture has really changed. See, I remember, I remember more than 30 years ago, probably 35, 40 years ago, when I would go to a restaurant, I learned this thing. I would walk into a restaurant, I'd ask for the maitre d'. There was a real fancy restaurant, right? And, and if I wanted to go really nice place, I'd go to the Red Lion Inn, right, by SeaTac 
uh, in, in Washington State, and I'd ask for the Mater D. And I'd, I'd say to him, can you give me the best seat tonight, sir? And he'd say, absolutely. And I'd say, what, what, what's your favorite thing on the menu tonight? And he'd tell me the best thing on the menu. And I'd slip him five bucks. I'd tip him. Now, today, who goes to any establishment and trust that they're going to tell you what's best for you? Like, when you go buy a car, do you go and say, oh, this is Sheraton Ford, and because it's Sheraton Ford, you know, I trust in the name Sheraton Ford, and you say to the salesman, tell me, sir, what is the best deal on the lot? When you go to a restaurant, you say, is your food good? No, no, see, the, the culture has shifted today. Nobody believes what the establishment says about itself. Today, you read the reviews. You read the reviews. You, you read what do other people say? What do the customers who are unhappy say about your business? Right? What do the critics say? Exactly. Right? Like, it, it's a change in culture. Does anybody remember a day when you used to, because it was Mr. White owns this business, you go to Mr. White, and because Mr. White told you he's going to take care of you, and he's going to give you a good deal. You just trust what Mr. White says. Anybody remember that day? Right? Raise your hand. Yeah, a few of you. Right? Today, it's not like that. The culture has totally shifted, right? And nobody goes just to the owner to ask them. People trust more in people who, read, who write the reviews than the people who own. So guess what? People watch what you do they don't necessarily listen to what you say. Because there's a lot of people out there that say a lot of things, but they don't live, they don't practice what they teach. Right? We did a message some months back called More Than Words. Do you remember it? You probably don't, right? Because we hear so many words today. And today, people watch what you do more than what you teach, right? Now, that's, that's, if I can say this, can I be really honest with you? That's a scary thing for people like me. Hello? Because I'm a teacher of the Bible. And I, I fear today that people don't really care that much. Some people do. But they can get Bible teaching anywhere. They can turn on the internet and they can listen to 10,000 different people. There was a day in this church when that song that we sang meant something really powerful. One word from you, Lord, spoken in the truth of God's authority from his word changes everything. One word. It's not like that today. May I, may I say it honestly? People hear the word. They say, meh, maybe. We'll see. Maybe we'll do that. Maybe we won't. I don't know. Hello? Help me out. It's not, it's no, we don't, lo we no longer live in a culture where people hear the teaching of God's word and they say, God said it. That settles it. We've gone to a day where people say, God said it, okay. I may or may not believe it, and I may or may not put it into practice. It depends how I feel and what my friends are going to do. Come on, help me out. Come on, I'm just telling you the truth. Listen, as people who, who love Jesus and follow his word and claim and sing that we love his word. One word spoken in God's authority should change our thoughts about what we're going to do. And I fear that today people read the reviews. They follow what their friends are doing and what the opinions of people are more than they follow the authority of God's word. I hope that's a word 
that challenges our heart. If you're listening online, send me a, ch- send me a chat, you know, and tell me, I believe in the authority of God's word. Amen? Well, once again, right, is we are called, all of us, to be, to model an example, right? And we've got to find a balance. Hear me. Don't miss this. We can't be so rigid, so formal, that our life is not realistic for people to follow. Listen, on one hand, we are called in service to the king. When, I, when I'm here, wherever I am, I'm in service of the king. But I have to be relaxed and authentic. I can't be so formal and so rigid that it's unrealistic for people when they see me that don't know God that say, I want to do that. I'm attracted to that kind of life that I want to follow Christ. Amen? Praise the Lord. Are you with me on that? Okay. So next, verse 3, the mature women, they are to exhibit similar behavior. They're to be reverent, respectful, right? And that's literally what it means. It means like those employed in sacred service. They're aware that they have a calling, that they've been called unto the service of the king. Can can any of our ladies say amen to that? Like, you you know, I love this. This is, you know, in in the writings of um, Nate Saint and Jim Elliott, that was something that just caught my heart. They saw themselves as workers for God. Not, Not observers, They saw themselves as workers for God, in their words. I'm employed at the service of the king. I'm not here on my own authority. I'm not here. I have a calling. I've been called. Is there anybody here? You've been called to serve the king. Relaxed, authentic, transparent, informal perhaps, but absolutely in service of the king, right? And then notice what it says here for for the mature women. It says that they must be careful not to be false accusers, that is, slanders, that is, jumping to conclusions about someone's character, right? It, It means that we assume to know or to sense something about people when you first meet them. Now, is that, is that odd that that is something that is said to the mature women? No, it's not odd. Let's be honest. Young girls, from the time they are young girls, are given extra caution. Watch out. Watch out for them. Watch out for him. Watch out. Be careful what you watch. Be careful, little eyes. Be careful, little right ears. Right? We, we, so women grow up being extra cautious. So then are we upset when they use what they've been told all their life to be extra cautious when they see people? No, that's just, that's just natural. But we have to be careful not to make judgments about people based upon their current condition. Because this is the reality. People walk through the doors of the church, and sometimes, if I could say it, maybe they're a little rough around the edges. But God calls those things which be not as though they are. And you have to look at people and see their potential, not just their condition. Are you with me? Right? It's really important to look at people and see who they will be after Christ comes into their life, after Christ transforms them. Right? And, and it's good that, that Brian got up for just a moment, but because Brian might be one of those people that came in the church a few years ago and was a little rough around the edges. If he was here, he would say amen. But guess what? God has transformed his life. And I could go through a series of things that God has done in his life that are so amazing. Is it true? It's true. And God's not done with him yet. And God's not done with me. Right? 
but God is doing a work in him. And you know what? Sometimes a few uncharitable words can stunt the growth of a believer if someone says things about them too quickly to judge their character before God transforms them. Are you with me? I remember uh, being in Bible college, and, and I've told you before, when the first time I walked into the church where I got saved, I came in with OP shorts, a white tank top, puka shells, and my hair kind of with a little curl at the bottom, you know, flowing down to about my shoulders, and I walked in with flip-flops. And, you know, I, I think if, any, if somebody walked in here today, you would go like, Who, where does this guy think he's going, the beach? That's, I mean, and that's, I, was for, I lived in Hawaii for two years, and yeah, that's where I thought I was going, to the beach. And I dressed like I was going to the beach. And one night we were fellowship, and I'd been in the church about a year, and I got my, I, we were a little bit Baptist, forgive me, okay? But I had a blue, dark blue wool pinstripe suit with white, remember that suit? Right? She doesn't. And uh, I got a red tie with polka, white polka dots. You know, that was after transformation. <laughs> oh, boy. But listen, listen. A girl, we were in the, lo- in the lobby, and we were just laughing and talking one night after Bible college. And she just made a small joke, pierced me right through my heart. She looked at me and she said, yeah, I never thought you'd be around. I thought you'd make it here about two weeks when I saw you walk through the door, I thank God that there were other people in the church that didn't think like she did because I would have picked up on it and I wouldn't have been around. I almost wasn't around. Thank God that somebody saw through eyes of faith, not through eyes of slander. Amen? Are you with me? Are you, are you with me this morning? Listen, not given to much wine. It means not having been enslaved, not addicted. It means you can't live without it, right? Teachers of good things, right? This is interesting because it really means not formal teaching, but advice and encouragement. They give privately by word and example. Hey, you know what? People learn more by what happens in the lobby. And when the ladies get together and talk and they're making a meal, they learn so much through that. It's not always from the pulpit. It's not always from the class teaching from the the platform. People learn by what happens behind the scenes and what is said. We call them underlying assumptions, right? People learn by the, we put these things on our wall. These are artifacts. People look up there and they go, oh, going on to maturity together. Oh, that's nice. Then they watch what we say when we go out to eat. And they learn more by what we say behind the scenes. They go, oh, that's what they say publicly. These are their espoused values. But behind the scenes, this is what we really believe in practice. Oh, that's what pastor preaches up on the stage, but this is how we really live and make decisions. Those are called underlying assumptions. That's what people really learn from. Are you with me? Okay? So, it's, that's so important, right? Okay, and then it says that they become sober, sensible. They love their husbands and their children. You know, it's amazing how a godly woman can love her husband and love her children and bring the best out of her family and do more to fashion her family than, you know, a husband or teaching from a pulpit just by living a godly life. Amen? Are you with me on that? Right? And then he says... Um, you know, um, he's looking, God is looking for us to be the kind of people that are constantly aware of bringing the best out of others, not just seeking what is best for ourselves. 
And notice, this is for a purpose. It says, so the young women may be discreet. That is, live purely. Keepers at home. Oh, that's a good one. Do you, do you appreciate that? It says, keepers at home. Now, in the Jewish home, that's what the wives did. The men went out, they worked in the farms, and they did what they did. And then the women took care of all the affairs in the home. Now, that may not be the way that it is today, and that's okay, right? A husband and a wife must develop symbiotic relationships, mutually complementary relationships, and, and they work it out. What works best for them? Hello? Right? We work together. We say, these are our relationships. This is how we're going to work together, and they agree on it together, and they fulfill the responsibilities that they've agreed on, right? And, you know, it's such a beautiful thing that, you know, that, that, you know, proverb from the big fat Greek wedding has a lot of truth, doesn't it? Right? Remember the husband? He said, I am the head of this house. And she said, yes, but I am the neck that turns the head. Right? And we know this reality, right, that that a godly woman has tremendous influence in the home, right? And she can bring the best out of her family, and also she can bring out the worst. Because if mama ain't, how do they say that? If mama ain't happy, ain't no one happy, right? And there's a lot of truth to that, right? And this is something important, right? It says, you know, um, that they are obedient, to their own husbands, King James, right? I didn't say it. Don't get mad at me. Preaching to my wife, just, just having fun. That they're obedient to their own husbands. Can I get an amen? No. Did you ever see, sorry, I'm going to distract for a sec. Did you ever see that video where the husbands, the preacher, are talking about their wives, and it just goes through all these scenarios you know the pastor's up there and he's making an illustration and he uses his wife so he's preaching and then he says just like my wife and you know goes on and on and on you know and the wives get up and walk out the wives are doing all kinds of things the husbands use the the wives the illustration listen obedient aren't you thankful for my wife she's been such a godly 33 years yesterday 33 years yesterday We've been, you know, and, and you know what? She's, she's, net, she's always been a person who is so gracious and handle, carries herself so well. You've never been embarrassed, you know, by that woman. Amen? She's always handled herself in such a godly way, and I thank her for that. Amen? But at home, she needs to be obedient to her husband. No, I'm just, I'm just talking big because I'm up here. I'll, I'll, I'll bring her some flowers later. But listen, what does that mean? It means that they understand their role. A woman, please hear me, don't miss this. A woman understands her role. She understands her strengths. She doesn't, we live in a, in a society that women are set up that they have to compete with men. That cultures have to compete with one another. That's just not the way it is in Scripture. We don't have, a wife doesn't have to compete with her husband. She has strengths that he doesn't have. And when she walks and lives in the strengths that she's been given, there's harmony in the home. And when she tries to, to you know, function out of her strengths and try to make her strengths stronger than his strengths, they have competition. They have strife. Isn't it true? And when a woman understands her strengths as a woman, right, she can walk and be in who, who she is, and you know what? She can bring the best out of her entire family. But when she tries to compete with her husband, it creates chaos and strife within the home. Right? So they don't have to fulfill the husband's role. They can be very comfortable in their own role. And that's where they find their strength. Right? They function in the God-given order. Right? Now, if they don't, it provides an opportunity. See what it says here? And it, 
you know, it provides an opportunity for people to speak against the word of God, right? Can someone say amen? Joan, can you help me out, Sheila? Right? Because this is, this is the reality. Is see, when there's strife in the home, people look and they say, how's that working for you, Christian? Right? And that's what people in the world are looking to do. Then he goes on to young men. Young men, verse 6, be examples of good work, uncorruptness in teaching, right? Have integrity in teaching and in influence. In other words, don't use your, your opportunity to teach and influence people for your personal. I lost it. Okay. Thank you. So we have to have pure motives when we teach. How about this? Sound speech that cannot be condemned, right? And this is along the same lines. Listen, there are unbelievers out there. And what are they looking for? They're looking for you as a believer to say something or do something that is out of step with Christ so that they can look at you and say, oh, and you said you were a Christian? so that they can justify their own behavior. Have you ever had it? Oh, aren't you a Christian? Right? And they see you lose your temper. They see you get angry. They see you do something. They're waiting for that opportunity. So he says, live, as young men, live your lives in such a way that people can't find any opportunity to condemn you. Don't give them an opportunity to say anything negative about you. That brings us to verse 9. Now notice what the Word of God says. He says, exhort slaves, and make no mistake, it's the word slaves. Exhort slaves to be obedient to their own masters, to please them well in all things, not speaking out in rebellion against their masters. And then he uses this strange word, not purloining, vas physomai, not to embezzle or pilfer, setting aside a little bit for yourself but showing all good fidelity. In other words, demonstrating integrity to your master because you ultimately serve the Lord. Now, may I say a word about this? We all know that slavery is wrong, right? It's despicable to think that one person, can you, I, it's hard to even say it. When I was preparing this, I, I had, I just said, can I even say this out loud? It is despicable for one person to think that they could own another person created in the image of God. And how could a believer in Christ think anything like that, right? So we all agree that it's, it's despicable to control where people work, what they do, where they live, who they marry, what they eat, anything like that. We all, and can we all agree absolutely wrong, right? But we do know there were some who lived in some lands who were in bondage, who had poor conditions and circumstances, and they chose to become indentured. They chose to be slaves, and the hope of going somewhere else was a greater hope for them than staying where they were. And they traded their freedom to work for somebody else, some for a period of time, some for a lifetime, because they thought it would be better for them. There were others who were, um, who were taken against their will from their homes and their families and their peoples, and they were put in boats and taken to other places, not just America, but yes, America, against their will. And it was deplorable. It was despicable. And it is no doubt a stain on our American heritage. But at the same time, America has worked to right its wrongs. And there were some things that were taught and understood and some things that were not understood, you know, a hundred years ago, that today we understand differently. And some, even the founders of our country, did not have everything right. Is it okay to say that? 
And I think any parent here, if you're a parent, there are things that you did when your kids were little that you've changed and you no longer would do. Hello? Right? Like, I did something that I'm not proud of. You know, when, when I was a kid, I lied to my mom. You know what she did? She took a bar of dial soap. I still remember the taste of it. She jammed it right in my mouth, in and out, and several times. Right? Hello, anybody? You been there? Yeah, I was there. And you know what? I, I did that, uh, I think, to one of my kids. Might even be sitting here. I'm not even sure. I wish I hadn't have done that. I did do that. Right? And there's things that, that people do, and you know what? They can't go back and change. And there's things that, that nations do, and not everybody back then had everything right. We don't have everything right today. And there's a lot that goes on in the world in which we live today that isn't right. And there's large corporations today that still use slaves from China, the Uyghurs. Uyghurs? Uyghurs, right? There's persecuted people and slavery still existing today. And you know what? That's wrong. Hello? Can you give me an amen? So listen. Um... We, we believe and we know that slavery is wrong, but it did take place, and it took place in America, and we cannot deny that, right? And hopefully, we personally and in our nation, we do everything we can do to make things right, whatever that means. And I think love, loving one another, is the best thing we can do right here, right now, today. I can't... I can't change everything that happened 150, 200 years ago. But I can love people today. Amen? Well, here in verse 9, we find an exhortation to slaves to be obedient to their masters and not speak out in rebellion against them or embezzle money from their masters because God sees their condition and the things that they've suffered, and he will write the injustices. God will write the injustices that were wrong in this life in the life to come. Listen, some must be resolved in this life, here and now, but some will be resolved in the world to come, and Christ will make sure this is a reality. Right? And as believers in Christ, we understand this reality. Not everything in this world is right. People get used and abused in this world. This is the promise of the scriptures. That the last will be first. And the first will be last. And some people who abused people and were in power and had positions and used them unlawfully, they will be last in the world to come. And those that they used and abused will be first. That is the promise. There is no promise in the scriptures that everything in this world is right. There is a promise in the scriptures that those things which are wrong in this world will be made right in the world to come. And if you're looking for perfect, you know, justice in this world, it is sad because you will never, there will never be a perfect human government. There will never be a perfect human society, utopia on earth. That will come in the future kingdom of Christ. It will descend out of heaven and Christ will establish it. And he will rule it with a rod of iron. And it will be perfect in that day. But not in this day. Right? So we find this principle in the word of God. That as we do it unto others, we do it unto Christ. And so here is this command, even in the word of God, 
that if you find yourself, and in that day there were slaves, if you find yourselves as a slave, be a slave unto Christ and serve your human master as you would serve Christ. Don't back talk, don't rebel, serve as unto Christ, and Christ will receive your service and he will promote you in the life to come. Don't steal from your master and set a little aside and embezzle in order to take care of yourself. Trust Christ, and he will bless you, possibly in this life, and if not, in the life to come. But you do what you do before God as unto Christ, and Christ will see, and he will reward you openly for what you did secretly. Can't help but think of Galatians 6, 9. You know, I'm, you know, be not weary in well-doing. In due season, you will reap if you don't faint, if you don't quit. Listen, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Not everything, like we, everything isn't made right in this world. Ultimately, what we want to convey today is God sees, he hears, he knows, he's watching, and he will repay people who model an example and live their life for him, and he will reward them. And so our to you today is, you know, be an example, model an example as a, as a mature man, as a, as a mature lady, as a young man, as a young lady, wherever you are in life, as a slave, as a person in a difficult situation, in a tough marriage, whatever it is, do what you do unto the Lord and the Lord will see and he will reward you in this life and if not in this life, in the life which is to come. We are called to be examples. Amen? Lord, we just commit this to you today. And teach us, Lord, just to, to function in who you've made us to be and be the kind of people that bring glory to you in whatever situation we're in. And we just, we just say from the depths of our heart, here I am. I am available. You call. Lord, I hear. I am available. Use us for your glory. Wherever you place us, wherever you move us, wherever you take us, whatever you do, work by your spirit and fulfill your will in us. We ask this of you in the name of Jesus Christ. If you're here today with us online, I know this is a strong message and a difficult passage of scripture, but if you've never given your life to Jesus would you just say a prayer with me today? Say, Jesus, come into my life. I receive you as my Lord, as my Savior. Everything in this life isn't just. Everything in this life and the world in which we live is not right. But I trust that one day you will right all the wrongs and make everything right according to your perfect justice. We commit it unto you in the most holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. May God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. It's good to be in God's house today. Amen. And uh, thank you for all that are joining us online. Just want to speak a brief word about the offering this morning. In Hebrews uh, chapter 11 and verse 4, we read, By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. So giving and faith kind of go together. And, you know, sometimes God uses finances to test our faith. Uh, maybe there's been an occasion in your life where you've been faced with a decision of, okay, am I going to pay the mortgage or am I going to be able to put my tithe check in the basket today? And it's a test of our faith when, when things can get to a little bit of a desperate place.
But it's kind of interesting that in, you know, we all know Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of fame of the biblical heroes, and the first person that gets mentioned is Abel, one of Adam's, Adam and Eve's sons. And what did Abel do that caused him to get into that hall of fame along with Moses and Abraham and all these other Bible big shots? You know, what did he do? He really didn't do anything all that great, didn't accomplish much, never took any major risks. But you know what made Abel great? It was that he gave his offering in faith. He gave his offering in obedience to God. You know, God's really not so much interested in, in how much you give. God's interested in your heart. You know, and that goes right to that song that we sang this morning. We, we need to give all of our heart to God. It'd be great if we could give all of our money to God, but that's really not practical. But we can give all of our heart to him. And uh, so would you pray with me this morning about the offering? If you're home, you can give online. Uh, you can mail a check to the church office. Uh, if you're here with us, you can drop your check in the basket. My, our check's in the basket back there already. And, Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for all you do.